This week's episode was brought to you by Cooper Julius. If you enjoy listening to The Whole Rabbit and would like to help us keep making weird content that's hard to explain to your friends, please visit www.patreon.com slash The Whole Rabbit, where five bucks earns you access to all our extended shows, a five by five vinyl sticker of our cover art sent to you at no additional cost, and access to our Discord server, which is fast becoming my favorite part of the show, and the internet. This week's episode, we discussed the production history of Ghostbusters and some of the real life material of the movie draws its inspiration from. This episode is significantly longer for Patreons, where we discuss the scientific basis of ghosts and a detailed breakdown of each ghost hunting instrument, traditional and modern. The free show is a little bit short this week, so I put a tiny sample of the extended show on there so you know what to expect when you sign up. Thank you and enjoy the show. Supernatural, but not that. I don't want immortality. You don't want immortality. Why? Because you don't want to drink blood? No, because I'd, I'd drink buckets of blood for some special powers. I totally would. But you don't want... I don't want immortality. Because you'd get bored. Well, you could kill yourself still. Mari makes a good with point. Like a yeah. You know, Buddha killed himself go, with you pork. Can a lot of people. You could go sit in a church until someone spills some holy water on you or something. Why wait? Just jump in. I a painful death. I would stab myself through the wooden stake. That seems pretty straightforward. Not a whole lot of yeah, running yeah. involved. I think you just have to fall onto it. I don't know if you can really self-terminate yeah. if you're a werewolf. Oh, no, I'm not talking about werewolves. I'm talking about vampires. Well, oh, vampires. I'm sure vampires can self-terminate. I don't think they have any sort of code prohibiting them. Yeah. If you didn't try to hurt yourself, you'd just keep living. Or if someone didn't kill you. Well, you'd have to be indefinitely addicted to blood. And I have, I've had my addictions, and... Uh, be, that doesn't sound fun. That'd be a huge downer. No, listen, if we're talking vampires, I don't think you could accomplish it because then how are you going to cut off your own head after you stab yourself with a stake? I think this is built in. I think they make it so vampires can't really kill themselves. I mean, you could get some help, sure. And with a werewolf, you don't even get to like enjoy the beast form because famously uh, they don't remember what happened. So right. I would I would be a vampire sooner than I'd be a werewolf. Blacking out once a month is like being alcoholic, but you black out less. What if you just, the second you came out of your werewolf blackout, you just started drinking and then maybe you could trick it. So when you came out of your drinking blackout, you like came conscious in your werewolf mode and then you would basically be a superhero. Hey, maybe it's uh that is definitely something I would, I would try. Now we're thinking are like an eighties movie. Are we recording right now? Hello everybody. And welcome to the whole rabbit where we don't just lift our girlfriends off the ground while chanting quietly in a circle around her. Stiff as a board, light as a feather. Stiff as a board, light as a feather. No! Here at the whole rabbit, our girlfriend actually sleeps above the covers. Four feet above the covers. She barks, she drools, she claws. Because this week we discussed the 1984 cult classic paranormal blockbuster special effects comedy epic for the ages. Ghostbusters. So strap on those proton packs and prepare to cross the streams because I'm your host, Luke Madrid, and this week I'm joined by the co-hostess with the mostess, Mari Sama. And our special guest, back from the Apocalypse Now episode, miraculously, Ancient Gregarious. West, as I was called back then. Is Can I call you Ancient Gregarious in the intro? Yes, absolutely. We'll call you West or Ancient Gregarious, and people just have to figure out which one. Sure. But we've been friends for a long time. He knows some things. We watched the movie together last night, and now that makes us experts. Mari, it was the first time you've seen it. Absolutely. Yeah, it was. So I need I need to study it a bit more, but, you know, it, it I could see why it's a classic, definitely. But you've seen, like, Blues Brothers and... Yeah, like, I'm a huge fan of Dan Aykroyd. So I wouldn't mind. I didn't mind watching it. I like Bill Murray, too, but he's kind of a he kind of he's kind of a dick in this movie, though. What I really liked is at the beginning, it was set up like a very real horror film. It was put into a library. There was real suspense. They actually took a real swing at setting up an actually terrifying beginning, especially for 1980. Right. Yeah, the uh, opening scene, uh, the setting really reminds me of like a classic horror film like um, Poltergeist or The Exorcist or something like that. I think the setting for Poltergeist was inspired by the same events, which was the Enfield Poltergeist, as it's most commonly known. There was a lot of focus on statues a lot through the film. I mean, I think the opening scene was the lion statues in front of the library. And it had always been attaching to like, you know, kind of gothic or, or you know, I'm not quite sure if that's gothic, but uh, 
definitely a lot of uh, statue. Yeah, gothic. Think, you know what I think? New York is. is very gothic. And that was yeah. an aim of the film was to bring that out because it was going through a bit of a slump, like with crime. It more, most importantly had a bad reputation. People didn't want to go there. It was during the rise of SNL. And so part of what they were doing was bringing television back to New York where it had originated. And they wanted to kind of get like that glory days of New York back. And part of Rittman's vision was to make that the film where is like Dan Aykroyd had this like crazy sci-fi epic planned but Rittman's like no let's just make it like realistic like in a city and then we'll move into like the crazier stuff and by the time we get there people will believe it. Dan Aykroyd's original script is pretty crazy and he also wrote um, John Belushi into it but I think he died unfortunately before it be funny funnier I think. You think it would have been funnier with uh, Belushi? Oh yeah. So I have a little bit here about Dan Aykroyd because he was sort of the creative push behind the film. And without him, we really wouldn't have Ghostbusters. Dan Aykroyd was born with syndactyly or webbed feet on Canada Day in Ottawa, 1952, to a civil engineer who advised public policy for the prime minister, Pierre Trudeau. Intent on becoming a priest until the age of 17, Dad would change routes, drastically attending university for sociology and criminology, but dropped out to pursue comedy, a career which led him to running an after-hours 505 speakeasy in Toronto for a number of years. Dan was paid $278 a week uh, to write for Saturday Night Live, but found his way onto the cast before the show began production. Uh, aside from the webbed feet, Dan is also said to suffer a mild case of Tourette's and Asperger's syndrome, but this did not prevent him from propelling himself and others to the top of the comedy scene, providing a, quote, Mount Vesuvius of ideas that would help accomplish SNL's mission of turning comedians into rock stars and nourish a troupe that would bring a golden age to the spoken English comedy era. Do you mind if I interject with the stupid thing I was going to say? Yeah, go for it. You know, the the New York being in perils is not a new thing to New York. There was the massive uh, crime-ridden era um, that went down a lot. Um, and uh, then they were locked down by coronavirus, which then they had 9-11 and locked down for coronavirus, which was huge. And uh, in October 2nd, Nick, Nick Moranis was actually... Uh, punched in sucker punched in the face by a random walker by and uh, it seems that new york is back why did rick moranis get punched in the face complete random attack apparently just his luck for being rick moranis oh god it's like he's it's it's like he's the unfortunate character he plays in the movie you know i noticed that none of the the ghosts they really fight are distinctively male i, I mean maybe the marsh state puff marshmallow is a sailor would be traditionally male there's certainly a phallic symbol with their ray beams and they certainly aim it as if as if they're aiming peeing um it reminds me of a of a story from uh when i was get i got really really smashed the bar with one of my buddy's friends he's got a good sense of humor but i think i went a little too wild when i said we got across the streams and i started peeing in the same urinal as him and, and uh across the street he went everywhere it was a terrible idea but don't cross the streams west i'm totally taking advantage of my anonymity right now my slight lazy anonymity i know me too right well it's all about teamwork you know love is not when you're peeing on each other it's when you're peeing on the same thing together. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like blood like, yeah. rubbers, but cleaner. Like nobody's pushing anybody down to get up. We're both taking a step up by spraying piss everywhere. <laughs> and that was the mentality behind the entire film, actually. Because perhaps Dan's most inspiring quality was his appreciation of synergy, collaboration, and teamwork. But what really inspired the film was the article that he read in Society for Psychical Research about spirit containment. And so Dan thought this would be a funny idea to combine this concept with something akin to the old ghost flicks that comedy troops like Bob Hope, Abbott, and Costello had done decades earlier. As such, Ghostbusters was written for himself, but also his spiritual brother, John Belushi, who died as a drug overdose and supposedly they wrote him in as Slimer. Oh, man. Yeah, the effects crew came up with all these different designs for Slimer. But then at the last minute, the writing crew, like the principals called, they're like, you got to make it John Belushi. And they're like, for real? Really? Make it. Oh, my God, that's fantastic. So they did the best they could. Besides Dan having what he describes as a JFK moment when he figured out that his brother, John Belushi, his spiritual brother had died, he took 
the chopping up of his script very well. He was very humble about it. The editing to his script was heavy handed on behalf of director Ivan Rittenman, who, having looked at the original script, was like, this is going to be three hundred million dollars. But if we can get Bill Murray attached to it, you're a great writer. I've had success in the past. I think we can get this thing going. Having proven that he could work with Force of Nature, the Murricane Bill Murray, he was able to convince Columbia exec Frank Price into putting up $30 million for the film's budget, which resulted in him immediately being set upon by lawyers and the higher ups to question his judgment that would now be measured along with the future of his career by the success or failure of the Ghostbusters film. The wisdom in town was that I had made a terrible mistake. Price said to Vanity Fair on the matter. Rittman had thrown up the number 30 million because he figured it would be three times what he spent on stripes. And that would suffice for Ghostbusters, which at the times he promised a lot of rewrites because the script without them was just way too big. It was dreary and it was transdimensional. It was very dark. It was a huge Lovecraftian metaverse filled with gigantic creatures and just innumerable special effects, like maybe even more than Star Wars. Long story short, Rittman just thought that people wouldn't really get it. And so if you want to know a little bit more about that original Ghostbusters universe, you can find it presented pretty well in the Ghostbusters video game, along with pieces of the unfinished third script, which is actually in production now. It was set to be released this summer, but now it's being released in 2021. Oh, I am buying that Ghostbusters video game right now. It's out there and sometimes it goes on sale. It's pretty good. It came out during the Gears of Wars days. So it seems like an over the shoulder like action shoot em up because that's just what was big. There's so if you're into that, it's fun. We're kind of the right age group for that. <laughs> Sounds like it'd be good in 3D. Well, that game, absolutely. like I just mentioned, it's written and voice acted by the original crew. So that's pretty legit. But yeah, I remember uh, Dan who had actually came out and said that it was that was essentially the third installment. That was the ultimate sequel to two, which you, oh, we should totally I'm going to watch tonight. You guys should absolutely join me. Part two. I have to oh, get yeah. up early. I didn't know Papa John would be starring in the new Ghostbusters. <laughs> I didn't know that either. Um, oh my god, what? Are we talking about the the infamous quote unquote third one that was supposedly not very funny and just they rehashed a lot of the same settings but kind of bad in like a weird gross way? Yeah, it's the new one. It's a shame because they do have like good female comedians uh, cast in there. But the issue was just the directing and how it was cut together and corporate sponsors and lots of corporate messages. I, I don't blame the actresses at all. It was just the directors and producers were just absolute dog shit. I that from my mind. That's right. Well, Aykroyd, the director Rittman and Harold Ramis had like all the control and that always helps. And people even give a lot of crap to the second one for being a failure compared to the first one. And if for somebody who grew up watching Ghostbusters and was a bigger fan of Ghostbusters than Star Wars by a long shot, I been thinking back to my favorite childhood memories about Ghostbusters. So many of them are from the second one. So, you know, there's always room. Yeah. There's always room for opinion on this stuff. At the time when they made the first Ghostbusters, director Rittman behold into Price and Columbia Pictures was totally terrified because he wasn't sure if audiences would accept the giant marshmallow man. He didn't know if it would be funny because when he did the test showing for the industry, like the industry showing, everyone was dead quiet. There was no laughing. And like somebody came and patted Rittman on the shoulder like, it's going to be okay, buddy. We all make mistakes. Rittman's relief came during the opening sequence, however, with test audiences alternating between laughing their asses off and covering their eyes in terror. He finally knew at that moment that he had a hit on his hand. And to be fair, when I was a little kid, that first ghost in the library is scary. Looks like a monkey, an ape. Yeah, when it, it changes is. into claymation. I like the art, the artwork they use. When Me too. The, the, the gum and the teeth came out like a, like a horse, unnervingly. It was brutal. And then the little uh, Slimer is like a, he's like a puppet or something in the, in the first one, at least. I'm not surprised that the uh, movie industry in the mid 80s, they didn't review it very well. They're all, they didn't have time. They, they have no soul. They had no souls. They didn't. Uh, basically, because Price was so put under pressure by his higher ups, which was Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola just purchased the, you know, the umbrella company. And they were telling Price, they're like, yeah. look, dude, you cannot have a comedy that has special effects in it. That's 
like it just doesn't work. You can't have the sci-fi comedy thing. It's going to fail. We don't want to put money into it. So you have to get this done in like a year. You have to get it done in like a year and it has to come out at its maximum time to make money, which is the middle of summer. So you have one year to do this. They told Rittman and Aykroyd and um, Ramis. So right out the box, Ramis, Rittman and Aykroyd committed to doing massive rewrites. First, they started Rittman's office and then they retreated back to one of their family's vineyards and they concluded their two week writing marathon in a very fondly remembered time where they just spent the day making meals with their family and then they would like work all night on the script. And they spent a lot of time trying to hammer out the key master gatekeeper plot and they did. They didn't even have all the details after the rewrite. Uh, Somehow they got Sigourney Weaver interested and things got even better. She was desiring a palate cleanser after successfully embodying the mythological Hall of Famer Ridley of Alien. Uh, Weaver won the audition by acting like one of the hellhounds of the script to hilarious and terrifying effect. Apparently, Rittman was traumatized and that was it. She was chosen for the role. That's amazing. And I think you you mentioned uh, last night she was not the first choice for the role at all, that they wanted somebody with more chemistry with Bill Murray. And there is that's how they were going to cast it. Yeah. And there is kind of a lack of chemistry between them. But it also works so well, especially when there says uh, when she says there is no Dana, there is only Zool. Zool. I was going to say gruel. And it was scary. And then immediately Bill Murray diffuses it with comedy. And it's just such it's one of those delightful things that you get when you watch old movies. It's not it's not cut in an expected way. The time isn't measured in a certain way. Like the timing isn't measured in a certain way. It's very they try out a lot of things that end up working really, really well. Like there's some shots where they could have lingered on something to like be like, look how cool this is. But they don't. You know what I mean? Like they really stick with the pacing of things and they move it along really quickly. They do. I think one of the only shots that they really lingered on that I really wanted them to was uh, I I think it was the shot of when they get to the top of the tower and they see the pyramid of Zool and the throne and and, uh, gateway of Zool. And uh, that shot was fantastic. I loved it. I remember in the VHS days feeling like I almost had to watch the whole movie again just to get like a little snap of those shots. When we rewatched them in HD, I was like, oh, my God, I can actually see these weird special effects sets. Like the weird sets they have when the crazy supernatural doors open on the top of the tower. I can't, yeah. Some of those details were really lost back in the VHS, probably recorded it from HBO days. You know, don't arrest my parents, please. This was a long time ago. I'm sure a lot of these movies, we, we're only now seeing them to the level we could see them in theaters back then. It, it was really that important to go see something in movie theaters back in the day. And VHS has used to be insanely expensive that was like very a a family decision to buy a vcr and now you can buy the vcr for the price of a house in detroit it's super affordable just to even get a look like an empty vhs tape they were expensive and then the rewritable ones were even more expensive miskatonic university the college from which dr venkman ray and egon hale is a well-known prestigious academy rivaled only by harvard in popularity for the children of the massachusetts gentry and is located in arkham of essex county in the lovecraft universe at various times and phases of its history or maybe just depending on who you ask miskatonic university keeps its occult studies and artifacts either mostly hidden or as a principal part of its identity in the forefront. It would seem that at the timeline which Ghostbusters belong to, the departments of esoteric study have declined. It seems likely under the direction of people like Dr. Vankman, Miskatonic University's once renowned occult studies has now declined into a disreputable and unorganized patchwork of basement dwelling researchers failing to produce any useful results upon which they can rest their name. In a bygone, long forgotten past, MU was known for housing works like the Necronomicon, the Unaussprechlichen Kulten, and even some jewelry belonging to an ancient race of sea-dwelling monster people known as the Deep Ones. So they actually go to a Lovecraft college. Oh. Yeah. It's the university that always comes up in H.P. Lovecraft stories. That's the college Dan Aykroyd wrote them into. It's a great homage. Well, it's hinting at the fact that the Ghostbusters universe has these unspeakable gargantuan terrors of preternatural intelligence that either might 
like, but more likely want to consume or enslave humanity for its own purposes. Yeah, it's a great way to set your world up. Like it kind of grounds where your how your universe works ahead of time, especially if somebody's familiar with those writings. It seems like Dan Aykroyd is familiar with an awful lot about the esoteric and the occult, in addition to just like your normal spiritualism stuff, because it's almost like he makes oh, yeah. fun of that. It's like he's making fun of Lovecraft. It's like he's making fun of Alistair Crowley and Philema without being disrespectful at the same time. Like a comedic exactly. celebration. Yeah. He's actually um, wandered quite a little bit, quite a bit into the uh, and UFOs and theories about um, uh, extraterrestrials. He's he's gotten very, very interested in that. He's so and great to follow. Down. Yeah. So anytime there was a technical reference to the paranormal or the occult, he was the advisor and the writer of that of that particular piece of dialogue. Right. So there's certain sequences in Ghostbusters where they just like ramble on about something funny, like in the esoteric. It was Dan Aykroyd who wrote all those parts. I remember you mentioning that, especially when uh, Rick Moranis was responding about responding to uh questions about what is going to happen what the the significance of the key master and the gatekeeper the summoning of zool and you thought you saw that immediately you saw these what he's rambling off and it was i don't know if it was one shot but it was a long long ramble with a lot of confusing words he was talking and, to uh, a horse wasn't out. he about like they had conjured zool before and all these this civilization had roasted in the the depths of a slower so and so would know what it was like to be roasted in the depths of slower that day. Like he had lots of funny lines that were about the world from which Zul had hailed and like what ancient powers that they had awoken in that tower. Because the whole plot of it, basically, that's OK. Spoiler. If you haven't seen Ghostbusters, you probably should. There's all this psychic turbulence coming out of this tower that was built in the middle of the city by what Evo Shandor, who had a cult in the 20s. And he felt that society had fallen so far that it needed to be destroyed. And so he built the tower, had a cult, and they would do these rituals on the roof to bring about the end of the world. And they had speculated that now it was actually going to happen. But they they ramble off those things so fast that you could almost miss it. There's a, quite a few of those things, but it's like Dan Aykroyd who's like, okay, this is what happened. This is why it's happening. You know what I mean? This is the words we use. Yeah, he- he wanted to like destroy the world and then rebuild it in, in his own paradise with his own slaves and stuff. That's very HP Lovecraft because from what little I know, there's a current running through all the Lovecraft where there's this ancient civilization, which is probably a projection of HP Lovecraft's pretty racist ideas and is uh, pretty normal to see at the time perspective that. <sighs> Basically, any non-white culture they thought was like worshiping demons, right? So they they take all they take they took like this whole spiritual ecosystem from the past and they just projected their own fears onto it. That's basically Lovecraft, and they they kind of mock that in Ghostbusters a little bit by making like with the Marshmallow Man and the the slore and the ch- choose the form of the Destructor, but it also seems like a little bit of a joke on Philema because you have like this goddess that comes and she's like uh, Sumerian. Babylonian? No, Sumerian. It's like, what's the difference? You know, they don't really know. She comes in the form of the Destroyer and what form does she take? Yeah, it's the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man, which is like a symbol of like safety and comfort. But she looks like, self-admittedly from Dan Aykroyd, the Michelin Man, who looks like the Venus of Willendorf, who looks like a marshmallow Aww. and is like a comforting. It's like the ancient symbol of comfort. It's like the most ancient symbol of motherhood. And so how Christianity adopts this ancient symbol of the priestess, the oracular priestess and the goddess and adopts it as the whore of Babylon and is evil. And then Philema goes to like flip the narrative on it. Like Dan is hip to all that and he writes it into the movie, but his comedy Right. It's I love that about the movie. And I didn't even know that until like I started studying about this stuff later. And he did all this stuff before the Internet, dude. So he knew what he's talking about. Clearly, very, very talented. Yeah. So Dan Aykroyd's family is actually an outspoken group of spiritualists whose father, besides being a civil engineer as a career man, wrote the history of ghosts and was the son of an Aykroyd who was a telecommunications engineer for Bell and experimented using crystals and other modern technology to communicate with ghosts as his father before him had been a mystic and a dentist that would regularly correspond with Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes and was a member of the Lilydale 
Society, which was a movement for spiritualists and free thinkers back in the turn of the century. As such, Seances, Ouija boards, psychics, apparitions, ghosts, spirits, possessions, omens, divination, and ritualism were topics and activities that an acroid is expected to be familiar with, making some of the jargon and references in Ghostbusters uproariously funny, as we discussed, to both normies and weirdos. In the second film, the Ghostbusters disguise themselves as civic engineers to dig down into the streets to replace subterranean phone lines as a proper homage to Aykroyd's other family careers. Likewise, without Ghostbusters, the iconic image of the gadget-wielding eccentric group of weirdo researcher friends might never have dawned in the public lexicon. Had anyone ever thought of trying to use technology to hunt ghosts until then? Oh yeah, Dan Aykroyd's family and friends. So we should be so fortunate to have the experts, both possessed of practic civil intelligence and razor sharp wit to produce Ghostbusters for all of us. If not for this cross-pollination of artistic, practical, and esoteric know-how, it's likely that Ghostbusters just never would have made its production deadline because it involved over 100 special effects shots to which they were unable to outsource to other major effects studios because they were busy working on films like Star Wars Return of the Jedi. Their solution? Create their own effects company. Fortunately, Richard Endland, an effects expert who had worked on other Lucas films, was looking to bust out and create his own company as well. The two struck a rare deal and and they were off. This would allow Ghostbuster films to wield the spectacular visual effects for such an ambitious undertaking, and it paid off with eye-melting lasers, convincing puppetry and animation suited for a blockbuster. This wouldn't solve all the problems though, but it did help slightly near the end when the writers drew closer and closer to wrapping it up and resulted in the crossing of the streams line being improvised as the deus ex machina to defeat the antagonist at the film's conclusion. They would later insert a few lines of foreshadowing and nobody was any wiser. So they, they literally made that up on the spot. Wow. The don't cross the streams. They didn't know what to do. They like got to the part in the writing where they're like, well, I guess at the end, there's just like this uh, Sumerian goddess and there's like the, the marshmallow man and everything's on fire and uh, we'll end it somehow, right? And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then I guess when they're shooting it, they just came up with don't cross the streams. And then when they went back to the hotel scene, they put in the, the don't remember, don't cross the streams. That's incredible. Actually, um, <clears throat> one of the uh, special effects artists, because they were on such an insane rush, he had a scene where uh, the Slimer, or John Belushi's Slimer, was spinning across the scene, and they just couldn't get it to to look right. So what the, uh, let me look up his uh, name, maybe. Um, Terry Wendell, uh, who was working in animations, actually just tied a peanut to a string and sp uh, spray painted it green and spun it. And it looked right. And so they just had to go with it because there was no time to get anything better. That's got to be the scene I was just talking about, right? Where they 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 have it in the containment. They're like, we'll just put it back in there if you don't want to pay us, you know? Yeah. So Lilith Tully was originally cast for John Candy, but John Candy just was like, I'm going to play it as a big fat German guy with two dogs. And Rittman was like, yeah think that's gonna work so rick moranis was like oh thank god john candy did not love this script because it's the best script i've ever seen but i have a great way to pay, play lewis tully and he showed up he provided his own wardrobe he basically took it and ran with it and they're like okay dude you're a genius you totally understand this character and he really just owned that character like it was his thing he wrote like the he improvised little parts for it and it just came out exactly right Oh, it was so good. He was so milk toast. He was so pathetic. He was so needy. It definitely gets a reaction from that character. That is a fantastic character. He seemed to get the biggest smiles and laughs for me per second than any other role. Like going back and watching it as an older person. Uh, I love the part where it seems like he he's so into Dana, right? He like he's in love with her to the point where he has like all his clients in the house because he invites he invites his clients to the party, not his friends. And he tells them that like implying they're not his friends. And then this super hot blonde. She must have been a model at the time. He starts dancing with her, right? And she's dancing with him and they're like having a great time. And he goes and answers the door <laughs> like he had it, man. Like, you know what I mean? He just can't. Uh, I love it. Yeah, but he just wasn't that interested in her. He was no. all into Dana. Yeah, it's totally in love, man. Yeah, because I think more people in the party, I think, would draw. It, would, it was kind of all for Dana. I'm certain that that party was all for Dana and more people in the party were was more important to him than the hot blonde dancing with him because it brought him closer to Dana. Maybe, maybe if he just gets more people in. Maybe that would be them showing up, even if Dana has her boyfriend, because he knows that she has one. But it's that slight oh, chance. Oh, he's just, he's the, 
he's just flaunting at that point, you know, he's trying to look cool. But you can tell he's pretty good at taxes. He has a lot of clients and they they seem to have money and they have businesses, right? So he's good at what he does. Absolutely. And he's going through the line of like all the different food and how cheaply he got it. And uh, I think that's a really, really good party conversation. Well, Data hangs out with that other nerdy guy who's good at his job and Vankman's a hack. So from his perspective, why not? Like he's got a chance. Absolutely. He's the he's the uh, kind of nerdy guy. He's just as nerdy as them, although he isn't creative or interesting. All he's, all he's, his nerdiness is all about accounting and tracking the cost of something. With Bill Murray's character, you know, it's his field is really exciting. He's he's got a personality to him. He's, uh, you know, finding out new things about the world and taking the world by a storm. The other guy was one of the best musicians in the world. Pretty snobby, but. Nerdy, but interesting nerdy. He was the only one who was not interesting at all mentally. Ouch. On the other hand, though, it wasn't clear if Murray had even read the script. Like, you know, Rick Moranis had read the whole thing before John Candy had a chance to. And they weren't even sure if Murray was going to show up. And he just shows up at 8 a.m. on shooting day like he's supposed to. But they're also still not sure if he'd read the script. It was just like that the whole time. You know, he played a lot of his uh, he, he played a lot of his other characters. He brought a lot of Bill Murray into it. So I assume <laughs> that he didn't read too much of the script. Well, they sort of wrote him in that way, right? Like he was the one that didn't quite pay attention, that didn't really know the occult theories. And in fact, he was just abusing in the very beginning those flashcards and the whole psychic test just to get into Jennifer Shorts. Because the other guy, because the, the worst part is that his theory was actually being proven. Like if he had sincerely been studying because he said he's like, OK, look, I'm testing to see if stress has an effect on like psychic ability. And it, it was working like the more he was stressing out and shocking the first guy, the better and better and better he was getting results. Right. But it, it didn't matter to him. He was ultimately just trying to impress the impressed jennifer you know i didn't notice that and it's a really good point to to uh pick up and i suppose that the character that was written for B bill murray is the perfect kind of character to play if you haven't had or haven't read much of the script for bill murray exactly which plays into the genius of how they wrote it because he literally could just walk in there and just be bill murray you're right no human stacks books this way so I guess to wrap it up for the free show, which if you want to hear the whole show, go to www.patreon.com slash the whole rabbit, where for five bucks, you'll get all our extended shows. I'll send you a five by five vinyl sticker of our cover art and you'll get access to our discord server where it's an unending stream of madness, silliness and somewhat relevant occult information for those with the brains nerdy enough to decode it and Google a few things for themselves and hang in there with the conversation. So like we mentioned earlier, Dan Aykroyd is a spiritualist. He's been put on the spot before. Like, wait, you actually believe in ghosts, Dan Aykroyd? He's like, yes. Yes, I believe in ghosts. I believe that there is uh, something there worth looking into. And as mentioned earlier, it was a well-researched film. And a lot of it was taken from the Enfield Poltergeist case. For instance, the name Zool is taken from the possession of a medium who was sent to the uh, Enfield residence to bear witness to what had happened. And what makes the Enfield poltergeist case so unique is that they even have like a police officer that was present there that saw a chair slide across the floor by four feet. She put it in her police records and she just never stopped getting shit about it for the rest of her life. So this is one of those things where Dan Aykroyd's like, look, if you look into the movie even a little bit, like who's Zool? right because he wrote it in such a clever way where you're like is Zul actually an ancient Sumerian god well if you do a little bit of research it's actually like a, an important name in the Anfield poltergeist case where there's just so many records there were newspaper people that were there their neighbors bear witness to what was happening they didn't ask for any money they weren't asking for publicity etc cetera, etc cetera. and the journal that he had got the inspiration to do the ghost containment from the Society for Psychical Research, they sent somebody to go research the Entfield poltergeist, and he recorded over a 100 instances of just profound, strange weirdness. Like you can even listen to the recordings. I if 
if you are into podcasts, I, I know I, I, go check out last podcast on the left, the Enfield Poltergeist series. They do a whole three parts on it. They have a part in there where you can hear them talk to ghosts where they're like, are you here because you have a message for us? And then they knock once or knock twice and they kind of do this little dialogue through knocking. But every time they knock, it's like from a different part of the room and like stuff will fly off the wall and like hit people in the face. And it gets to the point where it's dangerous, right? It gets dangerous. So Dan Aykroyd's like, yes, I do believe in stuff like this. Maybe you should look into it. I think it's possible that ghosts can freeze people like they do in the second one. They can maybe push you downstairs and actually hurt you. And so Ghostbusters is drawing from a a rich tapestry of things that could maybe actually happen. And then it kind of like escalates into like the the giant marshmallow man, which in the in a certain perspective could be seen as a satire of Thelema worshiping the whore of Babylon and all that. So anything else? Yeah. Eat carrots and shoot lasers. Oh, so bunnies. Thank you for becoming a subscriber and hearing this part of the show, because I feel a little bad. I wanted to talk more about paranormal investigation in the free part of the show, but I thought, ah, fuck it. New Year's resolution is to add, not change the whole rabbit. I want to keep the whole rabbit podcast the way it is, but I'm going to add ghost hunting into the mix. I want to make a ghost hunting crew and get a, a camera with night vision goggles. Well, you know, you don't need the goggles anymore. I just like that word. You know how you have a camera with night vision built in and then you got a EMF detector and all that stuff. And I want to be ghost Ghostbusters now. I want to be the real Ghostbusters. So there. That's what you paid five. No, I'm kidding. So we're going to talk about the history of paranormal investigation now because, you know, you got to do your R&D. What Brian Regal refers to as an unorganized exercise in futility, paranormal investigation, or as quote unquote real scientists would prefer to call it ghost hunting, is the art and pseudoscience of collecting evidence, usually in support of the idea of a haunting. The image of stumbling through a dark space, eyes transfixed into the inky black with the Handheld EMF meter protruding precariously in front is what the topic rightly conjures to people's minds. It seems safe to assume that the Ackroyds and the Ghostbusters have something to do with this. In terms of TV versions, in the last 20 years, the approach has not really gone much far beyond get her, right? Because they, I mean, what do you see when these ghost shows? They, they walk into like a haunted place and they're like, okay, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to harass the ghost. You're like, ghost? I can see a period stain on your pants, stupid ghost, you know, and they're, they expect like, you know, the tissue box to fly off the wall and hit them. And they're like, see, we got it on camera. That's like every ghost. Cameras are important, though. Yeah. Yeah. Having having uh, sensors around is important because there apparently there's a belief that there's some kind of electromagnetic disturbance or impression that spirits give off. Do you think that's true? I think it's true. They, it seems like when people have ghost experiences, they talk about cold spots a lot. Right. And that's a temperature change, which could have to do with elect with energy moving. Absolutely. I'd like to jump in here because that's, sure. that's what a lot of ghost hunters use is they use electromagnetic field readers and uh, they try to find interesting patterns. They can get playback as it's converted, as the readings are converted into sound. Um, so as a believer, from the believer's perspective, what the theory would be that these ghosts can operate on the, if you're if you're ignoring poltergeists, that ghosts can actually only operate and manipulate the electronic fields around them. Now these uh, fields also pop up from, say, light switches, they pop up from any electronics, they pop up from magnets. Uh, we, our bodies actually produce a, a small uh, EMF field. The entire the Earth as as a whole produces quite a big electromagnetic field, and our sun creates even larger EMF uh, disturbances and has a huge field. Yeah, so large enough to knock very- out communication, right? Like, like if you get a sun flare, Absolutely. it can knock out radio and satellites and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, which creates uh, EM. A lot of people have heard about EMP. Uh, it was used in a lot of 80s movies and 90s movies, uh, which is an electromagnetic pulse, which will disturb a lot of these fields, 
cause things to shut off, cause things to short. And creating an EMF is actually how electronic engines work, especially, you know, in the Tesla. It, it's able to move things throughout it by creating these fields in a sequence uh, with electrons. And that's basically how you use electricity to make movement without combustion. So from the skeptic's point of view, you say, well, these EMF fields are everywhere. And as you know, you you can use it to to listen, quote unquote, when you have it transferred into noise, when it's translated into noise rather than just seeing waves. And the waves wouldn't be very accurate either because the waves are going to be coming from all sorts of directions all over the place. If you wanted to take the skeptic's view, you could say that the human brain is so good at recognizing patterns because we need to. That's how we survived as ancient humans. We see patterns in things. We try to learn lessons. We see patterns in the static. We see faces in the clouds. We see uh, a bear or a dragon floating across the sky. Skeptic's theory would be that what we're trying to find in those EMF vibrations are little suggestions of what might be uh, human-like speech. It, it, it's interesting to look at it from, from both sides. I think EMFs are cool no matter what. 